a little bit about the management of trauma, uh, since it uh, is something that every ophthalmologist has to deal with. And trauma can be classified into two different groups. Those tra trauma events which are open globes and those which are closed globes. The open globes can be classified into ruptures, penetrating trauma, intraocular foreign bodies, or perforating trauma. The difference between penetrating and perforating is the perforating goes inside the eye. Mm -hmm. Penetrating is only partial thickness. So there are uh, ways in which we can grade the trauma. Certainly visual acuity is important in prognosis of good visual acuity usually signals a good prognostic outcome. The other important indicator is the presence or absence of an afferent pupillary defect. And finally, the location of the injury, whether it's isolated to cornea, whether it involves the sclera, or whether it is posterior eye, makes a difference in the outcome. Similarly, closed globe injuries can be classified in the same way. You have uh, contusions, lamellar lacerations, which do not perforate superficial foreign bodies. Once again, the visual acuity is important, the presence or absence of an afferent pupillary defect, and the location of the injury are all important prognostic factors. So in a retrospective study of 150 patients with open globe injuries, the significant, all, of, all four of those classifications of those predictors were important, but the most important were the grade and the pupil. So what's so very important is when you first evaluate a patient with anterior segment or corneal trauma, you need to go back and look at these prognostic factors, the type, the grade, the pupil, and particularly these two, the level of vision at the beginning and the presence or absence of an afferent pupillary defect. And with those two factors, you can get a very good determination of how well the patient is going to do. So uh, what are the goals of management? First of all, to prevent further injury. Very commonly, patients come into the emergency room. They're seen by non-ophthalmologists initially. And sometimes the attempt to examine the patient can worsen the initial injury. So our first goal then is to protect against further injury. The next goal, of course, is to restore optimal visual function. Thirdly, we want to restore normal anatomic relationships. And then we want to prevent the longer term complications, including glaucoma and retina problems. So the most important thing you can do when a patient comes in like this until you are in the operating room is to protect them in some way with glasses or a, a shield, some way in which there's no pressure on the eye and no possibility of worsening the injury. All right. So uh, the principles of management are, first of all, to have a good surgical plan. You know, when you go in to do cataract surgery or a capro or a transplant, the steps are usually set for you. But in trauma, you only know what you're going to do really when you're on the table, on the operating table. But you need to go into the operating room with a plan in your mind. And of course, based on your assessment of the extent of the trauma, uh, it's important to make sure that you and your surgical team have the right instrumentation. So there are three things you need to be able to do. One is to conserve tissue. Do not excise tissue unless it's absolutely necessary. Secondly, to minimize any further damage in the operation. And thirdly, always a willingness to change the plan. Finally, in addition to protecting the patient from further damage, you want to take steps to prevent infection. If you have a very small corneal perforation, often simply patching the patient will be adequate because there is stromal swelling that will seal the perforation. Cycloplegia may or may not be the right thing to do because sometimes 
The iris is what plugs and closes the wound. And if you're going to the operating room, you may want to leave that iris there until you are in a control situation in the operating room. Mm -hmm. Oh, do not use cycloplegia if the iris is closing the wound because yeah. you don't want to pull the iris away from the wound. If patching is not a good option, another possibility is the use of a bandage contact lens. This is particularly helpful in patients with partial thickness lacerations and good tissue apposition. It's good to use a tight contact lens, which actually compresses the tissue. Uh, and we normally leave the lens in place for 24 to 48 hours, unless the chamber is flat. And a bandage contact lens can also be used as an adjunct after sutures or tissue adhesive is used. Let's talk a little bit about tissue adhesive. Uh, remember that cyanoacrylate glue only sticks to surfaces in, from which the epithelium has been removed. So you need to de-epithelialize the cornea around the area onto which you are placing glue. And this uh, works unfortunately only on perforations under two millimeters. Over two millimeters, the glue will go inside the eye and cause a tremendous inflammatory reaction. So the glue is very inflammogenic. It is also extremely antibacterial. So it's a good way of preventing uh, yeah, inf infection in the wound. Okay, there are two ways to put, a, put glue on the eye. One is uh, what I call the drip technique, in which one stabilizes the eye under a microscope cleans with betadine, and then uses a tuberculin syringe with a 30-gauge needle to extrude just a drop of glue, and then you touch the area that's perforated, and the glue will immediately seal that area. The other way, which is probably more commonly used and which can easily be done at the slit lamp, is to use a dermatologic punch and... Uh, use the punch to make a little three millimeter circle of plastic, put a drop of glue on that circle, attach it to the end of a wooden cotton tipped applicator with some ointment, mm -hmm. and then just touch it to the eye. The glue, the circle of drape, the wooden cotton tipped applicator and a little bit of ointment just touch that to the eye, the, the little circle will be glued to the perforation. Oh, yeah. So they were asking, like, do you leave the plastic uh, right on the yes. cornea? Yes, you do. You leave the plastic on the... You attach the plastic with ointment to the end of a stick, put the glue on the other side of the plastic, and just touch the eye with it. And the plastic stays there. And it's good because it covers the glue so that the patient is very comfortable. And, and, and when should we take it out? Uh, you leave it until epithelium grows underneath it and it extrudes it. You don't have to take it out at all. You do need to put a contact lens over it. Okay, there are some complications of using uh, tissue adhesive. We mentioned one of them is if the adhesive gains access to the anterior chamber, you can have a tremendous inflammatory reaction, including hypopia. It's very important to place a bandage contact lens while the glue is still wet before it dries. The lens actually becomes attached to the glue and stays on as long as the glue is attached to the cornea. So glue is, more, is useful for wounds less than two millimeters in size. When the wound is greater than two millimeters, that's going to require surgical management of some type. One should first culture the wound. That becomes very important uh, because all of these injuries are presumably contaminated. It's important to remove any foreign material from the wound and to carefully inspect the, with the shape of the wound because that's going to determine your surgical technique. Sometimes inspection of the wound cannot be done effectively until you're under the microscope. However, if you can, it's important to inspect the wound early in the course of the disease.
And it's important to determine if there are portions of the of a laceration which are perpendicular and portions which are shelved. If you close the perpendicular portions first, you will gain wound stability. And this is because uh, the shelved areas of the wound are generally self-sealing. So there are a variety of different needle types that one can use in repairing corneal wounds. There are round needles, generally called BV, because they're used in blood vessels. There are needles with cutting edges, and there are spatulated needles, which are flat. And generally, the spatulated needles are the best for corneal repair. Here's an example of the round needle, the tricurve needle, and the type of wound they make, and the spatulated needle. So you can see the advantage of the spatulated needle. Okay, we showed you uh, different types of knots that can be made. A surgeon's knot, which is the typical 3-1-1 configuration. And this is best used for wounds that are under tension uh, to separate because the first three throws lock the tissue together and give you stability. If you do not have a, a, a wound that's under tension, a better option is a slip knot. And this is done uh, not 3-1-1, but 1-1-1 in different directions. And this is the knot we use for most of the cases you've seen in the last two days. It uh, produces a very small knot, which is very easy to rotate and allows you complete control over the tension of the wound. This is not the reference to the book, but there's a wonderful book by Marion Maxi, which is all about suturing and ophthalmology. Mm -hmm. And it comes with a very nice CD. You can buy it if you go to the American Academy. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a wonderful book, which is very useful to have in your library. One of the uh, issues of geometry that many surgeons don't understand is very important and once you understand this you will have many fewer problems with your suturing and that is the concept of a compression zone and uh, this compression zone is the area between two sutures if you have a larger suture you need a larger zone of compression a smaller suture will produce a smaller zone of compression. And the best closure is when the two zones of compression overlap like this. So you would like the distance between two sutures to be slightly shorter than the length of the sutures. So if A, which is the length of the suture, is larger than B, which is the distance between the two sutures, you'll get a watertight closure. On the other hand, if, if the length of the suture is less than the distance between two sutures, you will get wound leak. So for example, when we close a corneal wound, as we do in keratoplasty, we don't so much look at the length of the sutures as we do the relationship between the length of the suture and the distance to the next suture. And, and really, as soon as you understand this and employ this in your suturing. Now, this goes for skin as well as cornea, but it's very important in cornea. As soon as you understand this, you will have no problems with wound leak anymore. Okay, very often when we're in the emergency room or in the operating room repairing a trauma, our goal is simply to get everything closed. But what I'd like to recommend is that you consider, even at the first repair, taking uh, steps to make the closure as meticulous as possible to promote good visual function. And if you take the time at the initial closure, then it's possible that you will not have to go back and do reconstruction. So closure of the eye. First, you want to avoid suture override, a wound override, and I'll show you what that means in a few minutes. Secondly, you want to try not to remove any tissue at the primary repair because you may need it later. Remember that we first want to close 
perpendicular wounds before shelved wounds. And as much as possible, we want to place sutures in order to avoid astigmatism. I'm going to show you in a few minutes how to close a zigzag incision, also stellate incisions. Let's talk for a minute about wound override. This is again a little bit of geometry. In a vertical wound, you would like the distance between the suture and the wound to be identical on either side. That will produce very good suture apposition. If the suture is closer to the wound on one side and further away from the wound on the other side, then you will get tissue override. Now, on the other hand, if you have a shelved wound, it's done exactly the opposite way. In a shelved wound, you do not want the suture to be equally distant from the front of the wound. If you do that, you will get tissue override. What you want is for it to be closer on the up to side and farther away on the acute side, and that will produce good suture, good wound apposition. And you would like the suture to be as deep as possible without entering the anterior chamber. And as we said before, we want to avoid tissue removal unless there is frank necrosis of the tissue and it's not viable. Okay, we've already said this, but I, I think it's worth repeating that the perpendicular part of the wound, the straight up and down part, will open with normal intraocular pressure. A shelf wound will seal with normal intraocular pressure. So in the operating room, in the management of trauma, you want to close the perpendicular wound first. So here you can see a graphic example of that. In the center of this graph, there is a perpendicular wound that will open with normal intraocular pressure, but the shelved part of the wound will stay closed. So the tactic should be to close the center part of the wound first. That will maintain your chamber so you can close the remainder of the wound in sequence. Very commonly in the operating room when we're faced with an eye with a terrible corneal scleral laceration and a traumatic cataract and uveal prolapse, we're not thinking about astigmatism, okay? You're thinking about saving the eye. But you should actually consider when doing your initial closure, placing sutures that will help you subsequently. And what you would like to do is to simulate the normal prolate shape of the cornea, which is steeper in the center and flatter in the periphery. So you want to use longer sutures near the periphery and shorter sutures near the center, which will give you a more physiologic corneal shape. So that looked at graphically, you will see that what the surgeon has done here is to use longer sutures in the periphery and shorter sutures in the center. And that will basically uh, try to ensure that the, sh the normal shape of the cornea is preserved. Now here you can see a, a, an example in the operating room and you might say, well, why would Dr. Manis be worried about astigmatism in a case like this? This is a terrible laceration which goes from limbus to limbus. But you notice that We've placed longer sutures in the periphery and shorter sutures in the center. And what that does is reshape the cornea. In addition, anytime you place a suture, you get some scarring around the suture. So in the optical axis, there's going to be much less scarring here than there is out in the periphery. So, uh, most corneal lacerations are not like this. Most corneal lacerations are zigzag. They are multidirectional. So how do we close those types of lacerations? Each linear aspect of the wound 
should be treated as a separate laceration. So let's look for a moment at a zigzag uh, suture. The logical thing we would probably all do is try to close the apices first. That's actually not the correct way to do it. And that's because the apices will often self-seal if the linear portion of the wound is closed first. So a logical way to do this would be, for example, to take this central expanse and close it with four sutures. Then you take the second leg and do the same thing. In this case, they have used a running stitch, but you can use a running stitch or interrupted stitches. The principle is the same. That is, that you close the linear portion of the laceration first. There are several other situations which require specific types of sutures. For example, this wedge incision and where we commonly see uh, lacerations of this type and that can be done by using what's called a mattress suture where you put the suture in each side of the uh, tissue and then pull the two tissues together tying the knot on the surface. The key to success is to make sure that the suture is at the same depth in both sides of the wound. Finally, uh, there are stellate lacerations, and these are extremely common. They occur from stab injuries most commonly. These are the hardest incisions to close, and commonly uh, the uh, surgeon will try to close each apex one to the other, but it's usually very difficult, and they almost always leak. Mm -hmm. So a better way to do this is to make, if there's room, to make stab incisions between the lacerations and do a running in and out suture that picks up each wedge of the star. This is a very challenging maneuver and requires a lot of patience to perform. Here's an example uh, diagrammatically of, again, of what it looks like. This is actually uh, not a stellate wound, but a, a wound with two arms. And you can see that the surgeon really never closes the apex specifically, but each arm of the wound is closed. And that's an effective closure. It unfortunately is right in the center of the pupil. I'm sure that in this country, you see lots of motorcycle accidents. We certainly uh, see a lot of them in the United States, but we have nothing like what you have here. And very commonly in uh, motorcycle accidents, people hit the pavement and lose tissue from the cornea, surface of the cornea. If there is frank tissue loss, what one needs to do is remove any necrotic tissue uh, and then uh, consider if it's greater than two millimeters using a uh, patch graft. If it's less than five millimeters, you can use a circular technique with, a, with an imprint tree fine, and I'll show you what that is in a minute. One can use either a full thickness or a partial thickness graft. In a partial thickness graft where there is a reasonable amount of tissue on the posterior side, one can use a full thickness patch graft uh, sized to the uh, size of the tissue defect, put it in position, and then use overlay sutures to compress the tissue into the closure position. Uh, more commonly, however, you have a larger area of tissue loss, and those patients need to have sutured patch grafts. So what you do is uh, you take a tree fine slightly larger than the area of defect, make a partial thickness tree fination, and you then use a blade, a 69 blade or something of that sort, to excise the tissue uh, down to but not into the anterior chamber.
And then once you've made your lamellar dissection, you can take a full thickness corneal patch graft, which compresses that wound and place it over the perforation. Here you can see an example of a full thickness graft over a central perforation around which you have taken away a lamella of cornea. And this technique produces a beautiful seal. In the event of a laceration, what do you do with iris? If iris is extruded and the a time between the trauma and the time you see the patient is short, it's reasonable to treat the surface with antibiotics and then reposition iris. If the iris has been out for 12, 24, 48 hours, which is often the case, it's probably necrotic or infected and needs to be excised. So that patient will need to have an iris reconstruction at a later date. But what you don't want to do is remove iris if you don't have to. Uh, in terms of postoperative care, almost all of these patients require topical antibiotics. You have to presume infection, even if there's not obvious infection. Secondly, cycloplegia is important, except, except when you have a perforation with iris adhesion that you want to leave that way until you do the repair because the iris may be helping you to keep the eye closed. In addition, all these patients need to be monitored very closely for the development of glaucoma, uh, either from contusion injury to the uh, filtration system or topical corticosteroid use. Uh, they, they are all prone to the development of high pressure. And you also want to um, watch out for endophthalmitis and ophthalmitis uh, doesn't have to occur within the first 24 hours. You can develop a late endophthalmitis if the wound has been seeded with an organism that only gains access to the inside of the eye later in the course of the uh, follow-up. In terms of suture removal, uh, generally you want to remove sutures prior to vascularization of the wound. Most strictly corneal incisions uh, the sutures can be taken out by three months. And a good technique is to remove alternate sutures, remove every other suture to see if the wound is stable. So frequently we will, if you have uh, nine sutures, I'll take out one, three, five, seven, nine, and leave two, four, six, eight to the next visit. That keeps the wound stable. Then you can come back and uh, take the remaining sutures out. So I think the messages I would like to leave you with are one, uh, even in an eye which is badly damaged, unless there is complete extrusion of the intraocular contents, you should approach the surgical management as if the eye could be rehabilitated. In addition, different suture techniques are obviously needed for different types of laceration. So you need to try and figure out the geometry of the laceration before simply putting sutures in. The surgeon's knot, the standard 311 knot, is good for achieving stability, but the slip knot will give you the best control for the remainder of the wound. And so what you'd like to do is uh, in your initial closure, use a suturing technique which will make the wound astigmatically neutral. So I hope that uh, these techniques will help you a little bit in managing trauma.